Hello again, this is a second part uh, of an overview of my where I am currently on this uh, robotic lawnmower, autonomous mower. I thought I'd go into a little more detail on some of the additional hardware and external items I had to add to get some of the features I wanted that weren't able, at least I wasn't able to get them to work uh, directly out of the RG Pilot software on the PixHawk hardware. Uh, some of the, there may be ways to do it that I just was not aware of, but anyway, this is what I've done. Again, much of this is just somewhat thrown together from things I happen to have already on hand uh, and would, you know, if I do it, improve this later, I'll likely change some of that hardware and consolidate some things, maybe use some smaller devices uh, and so forth. So anyway, so let me say the first, first thing I might mention is the safety feature that I mentioned in the first video, which is based on uh, using a relay in series with the seat switch that detects that an operator is present and shuts down the mower if the operator is not on the seat when the blades are engaged and, uh, and the mower is not in park and that kind of thing. I've got a switch, uh, relay in series with that. I put connectors there so I can reconnect if I want to without this system in place or connect the relay in series as I will have it for normal operation. Um, <clears throat> so uh, to, to do that, I assumed that the PixHawk with RG Pilot software, with RG Rover, the RG Rover version of the RG Pilot project, um, would be able to operate a relay from its uh, auxiliary I.O. Um, I read all about that in the, in, in, on some of the forums and some of the documentation, but it turns out that is not implemented yet in the RG Rover version. So um, it, that didn't, op, didn't work. I spent a good bit of time getting my circuit ready with a, a transistor to, you know, the, the, the RG, the, the PixHawk has a very low current drive, like in the microamps, and so you need a, a you know, a transistor to, to drive the, the relay. Uh, so anyway, I worked on all that and then could not find how to do that in the software to get it to operate and I learned that uh, it's not implemented yet. So um, s some people worked around it with a device such as this Turnigy receiver controlled on-off switch which will take a PWM input and operate a, a, a you know, a switch essentially that let switches up to 10 amps. In fact, um, I ordered this, but before it came in, I'd already worked on another solution but with something I just had on hand, and that is using an Arduino compatible board. I actually using a, I'm using a SparkFun red board, but it's an Arduino compatible board um, with a very, very small program that simply detects the PWM signal, uh, det you know, det determines what PWM value uh, is present and can switch off, uh, turn on and off that relay based on that. So I have it so that <clears throat> when this is operating, I can switch this channel five switch and shut down the mower by the Arduino detecting uh, that I've you know, changed that to the low end of the uh, PWM range and shutting it down. It, um, and another, uh, I chose rather than wiring that into the PixHawk, I, I wired the, Arduino PWM input, the, 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 the I.O. pin that's being used to read the PWM input, input directly to the receiver module. Uh, this particular receiver, anyway, I don't know about others, but it, it has the S bus output that's being used to, to communicate all the, the uh, remote uh, positions to the PixHawk, but in addition to that, the individual channel three through eight also operate independently, you know, reflecting the, the uh, signals from the, from the remote control. So I was able to connect channel five, which was that switch here, output of the receiver module directed to the uh, Arduino. That gives me a little bit more safety maybe in that if the PixHawk were to die or whatever, uh, I still have control of that shutdown relay as long as this receiver is operating. Another thing I wanted to do was have it so that if the receiver completely lost communication, the signal dropped from the radio control uh, transmitter, for instance, maybe battery died or just out of range, whatever, I didn't want the mower to continue to operate. So I thought that, I expected that if the signal was lost, 
the, out, the outputs from the receiver, the PWM outputs, would go to zero, you know, just quit working or whatever. But it turns out they hold their last value, which makes sense as far as what you'd want to happen to a, uh, an airborne device maybe. Uh, when it lost control, you would want it to just continue as is. Uh, so the outputs hold, except for the throttle output, which again makes sense. Maybe you want, you know, you don't want the, the unit to just, uh, if it's a, a winged device, you want to cut the throttle, but let it at least hold the, uh, uh, you know, air surfaces where they are, so that it will glide down or whatever. I don't know. Anyway, that's the way it works. So, so I had to. What I did was connected an additional uh, cable from the channel three, which is the throttle, typically to the Arduino as well. So it's actually reading two PWM signals and uh, giving a value re you know, proportional to what the PWM uh, setting is. And um, it, it turns out that the throttle, if I have the throttle at minimum here, then uh, I get a signal down to, I, I want to say it's like 990 is the way it is, at least with my current calibration. I get 990 if uh, minimum throttle, but if I turn it off or lose signal, it drops on down a little bit more. Uh, so uh, I've got a, an if statement in there that detects, you know, if the throttle is less than I think 880 is the number I'm using, uh, whatever value I experimentally determined, it was well below that. Uh, when the power was off. If it's below that, it kills the relay and shuts the more down. Or, of course, if channel 5 is uh, in the position that I want to, to cut off, the more it cuts the more off. So that's my safety feature at the moment. I feel pretty good about that. It's maybe not quite as good as a completely independent transmission from a totally different device and all of that, but, but that's uh, fairly foolproof, I think, the way I have it uh, operating. So that was one external <coughs> uh, device I added there. Um, and I'll, I'll show close-ups and talk about this more later. Now the other thing, uh, a big problem I had and had to come overcome uh, was the fact that this U-Blocks evaluation kit with the C is C94 M8P evaluation modules only have one UART, and that, that one serial output and input stream. That's coming directly from the M8P GPS module on the board. There's no separate microcontroller handling communication and you know talking to the module. The module is really connected through some glue logic and all but directly to the outputs. So um, what that means is only one device can talk to this at a time or generally in a system that's the way you'd have it even though it's got several connections for external devices and now it could be you know other multiple devices could be listening to it but so it turns out it has an RS-232 port with level shifters to, to full RS-232 levels. It has a TTL level uh, output and input on a, a, a header connector on, on the board. Uh, and it has connection to the radio modem that goes to the 915 megahertz radio between the two. Uh, so all those are sharing that one UART. So again, you, you don't have full freedom to, to use those ports uh, for, for multiple things at, you know, at the same time. Uh, where it really becomes a problem is that since the, the, the base is transmitting corrections over the air on 915 megahertz, that's coming in on the receive of the M8P module, so nothing else can talk to the M8P, M8P module. The PixHawk cannot send data to the GPS to set it up, give it you know, commands to tell it what messages it wants and what baud rate, any of that, because that line is in use. Um, but that's not too much of a problem because the, PIX, the, the RG Pilot software um, even though it may be sending out signals to set up the GPS, as long as I have set the GPS, the GPS up in the way that the PixHawk would be setting it up, if it were really talking to it, then it doesn't know the difference really. It seems to just time out on anything it would get an acknowledgement back and it goes ahead and works. So that part's okay as far as signals being connected. <clears throat> but the real issue is that the radio modems are operating at 19,200 baud, 
Now, they can be changed, but that's the default, and that gives you the best range. So I've chosen at the moment not to mess with that. I'm leaving it at 19.2. Um, but that means, this is just one UART, if I've set the baud rate for 19.2, that's also the baud rate that's going to be communicating the GPS position data over to my uh, Arju Pilot uh, PixHawk device. Well, it turns out that Arju Pilot and Arju Rover expects the GPS signal, GPS baud rate to be at 115.200. At least that's what I'm, I'm confident that's what's happening with my system anyway with the, uh, this U-Blocks GPS connected and it not actually being able to communicate in both directions. Um, it's sending out 115.200. I discovered that by, by snooping on that line with a, a TTL to USB converter hooked in to my uh, laptop and watched it and, and you know when I set my, my uh, PC at 115.200, boom, I started getting valid data that matched up with the data sheet. Everything looked good. So I knew that's kind of what was going on. Um, well, let me drop back and say, I didn't quite say that correctly. I bought, just for the purpose of, of determining this, a U-Blox GPS. Now, this is an M8N, a uh, very common version of the U-Box GPS, and connected it. I had to actually go in and solder some pins so I could come off to my TTL to GPS, TTL to USB converter and uh, read that into the PC. And I discovered that when it's talking to the PixHawk and working, it's doing it at 115.200 bald. And uh, so I know that the software could possibly be modified and, and uh, there are settings for the serial port baud rate, but all that seems to be ignored when it's communicating with a U-Box uh, uh, GPS. So that's been my experience anyway. Again, I'm, I'm not real knowledgeable of all this. So kind of a, a not very elegant solution to this was to give the GPS what it wants. I'm sorry, give the, the uh, Arju Pilot what it wants and convert the serial data coming out at 19.2 to 115.200. Um, I did that using a, an Ar Arduino Due module I had in ha on hand. I'd never used, had it for several years in the box. It has four serial ports, so I was able to basically just read byte by byte as a byte comes in on one port at 19.2, I'm spitting it out at 115.200 to the PixHawk. So that let things work. The PixHawk now is reading, you know, under, getting the data from the GPS all as well, except for one point that was pointed out on the forum, uh, and I certainly appreciate this and expect that I may have trouble, but so far I'm just kind of monitoring and trying to be to notice how things op work, but um, the, the PixHawk, I should say Arju Pilot really because it's all about the software and what it's expecting, it needs five inputs of, of GPS information per second, so a five hertz update rate. And so um, I looked at again on the PC looking at this M8N GPS and also then hooking up the the, the C94 M8P module as well, what I discovered was the, the messages coming across routinely uh, are the most I could really saw in one cycle were a certain set of messages that added together were 290 bytes. And if you work out the math, that means you need 14.5 k baud to communicate 290 bytes five times a second. So there's a little room there between 14.5 and 19.2 that I'm set, but that's not a lot of room. You, don't, you, you never really want serial communications that depends on buffers and things to get close to 100% of the available bandwidth. So, uh, you know, some things could happen that something's busy and, you know, I could have problems with late data lagging or missing. Uh, I realize that that could happen, so I'm still waiting to see, but at the moment I haven't detected that. It's been operating okay, so I'm not flying something in the sky, fortunately, so if it fails, it's just going to not work right out there on the ground. Got my safety features, I can kill it, so I'm not too worried about just playing around and seeing what happens. Um, but I may change. There are certainly workarounds to have the GPS uh, data upload through Mavlink 
that's part of the mission planner and uh, RG pilot in, uh, ecosystem and have it use that method of injecting the correction data and you know other possibilities but at the moment I'm, I'm trying to give this a, a, a shot with the built-in capability of the of the modules that I'm using so I think that's the status of the, the additional things I've added in at the moment um, to take care of little features that I had trouble with with the built-in uh, everything that's built into RG Pilot as it is but I'm very pleased with how well the PixHawk works, the, the connectivity that it has, all the ports and all. Oh, I'm using telemetry. Uh, I bought these 433 megahertz uh, telemetry modules once on the, connected to a serial port on the uh, PixHawk, and this one plugs into the PC with USB uh, so that Mission Planner can be in constant communication with the rover it's, as it's moving around. I've got a few videos showing the rover going across the field about a quarter of a mile to my house. I'll have those there on my YouTube channel also. You can watch. I'll do, try to do some more videos of it doing other things in the field. I'm still tuning uh, control loops and uh, I've done a lot of PID tuning in my career but there's, this is a little more difficult because not only is it just PID parameters, there's several other layers of control uh, with other parameters but I've it's, I'm fairly happy with how well it's working with no more effort than I've had uh, put into it. it it's, it's driving pretty well in auto. Um, and uh, let's see. I think that's all. I've certainly got some interesting points I'll make in another video. Sorry for this getting kind of long, but uh, related to the, uh, the locking mechanism that's built into the bad boy more. When you're, when you, before you crank it, you have to have the arms out, have it in park and uh, I've got those actuators connected so there's a little danger there. If they were to try to move while this is out, it would probably break, you know, tear up the actuator because these are in a locked position, won't move. Uh, so a uh, few little things there to, to do cautiously when you're cranking it up, getting it underway and all. Uh, and I may make some changes so that I can't, you know, so it'll be foolproof. Right now I'd have to do things in a certain order to be sure that I don't have a, a chance of of it trying to move those arms when they're in the locked position. Thank you for watching.